Hello brothers and sisters. I am Ogre6 and this is my first ever YouTube video. I apologize in advance both for my ineptitude and for my accent. Although this is my first effort, I have long enjoyed cruising the site and watching all of yours. A couple of weeks ago while doing this, I came across a video by a user named Oalos1. Oalos is Greek for the other, meaning that his name translates as the other one. And I'm going to call him that because English names are easier and I'm lazy. His video is called Famous Atheist's Last Words Before Dying. And in case I can't figure out how to post this as a video response, I've linked it in the description so you can watch it if you like. If you don't want to, I'll give you an outline. It's a bunch of horrified quotations from the deathbeds of Voltaire, Hobbes, and others, shown over mournful music, followed by very serene last words from Christians, and King David, who of course was not a Christian, but that's not his fault. The idea is that all these atheists were, at the end, terrified of going to hell, and there's a subplot of general despair as well. Now, there are several problems with the video, but I'm going to stick to just four main ones. The first should occur to any logical viewer right away, even one who's never heard of any of these famous atheists. And it's this. Why are all these people so scared of going to a hell they don't believe in? Is it possible that some of these quotes are made up? I thought that perhaps I should look into this more closely, and it was a Saturday, and I had nothing to do except fry some eggs and potatoes, so I did a little research. What did I find? Well, keep watching. We start with a personal favorite of mine, Voltaire. Hmm, abandoned by God and man, gone to hell. Simple enough, yeah? Later in the video, he gives another Voltaire deathbed quote. I'm not sure what that means. I'm also not sure which of those words is supposed to be the actual last. Voltaire, of course, was not an atheist, but a deist. He rejected Christianity and all other religions, but not God. I suppose a committed Christian might not appreciate the difference, but Voltaire did. Three months before his death, when he was already very ill, he wrote, I die loving God, adoring my friends, not hating my enemies, and detesting superstition. His actual last words were to a priest, come to solicit a last-minute confession to save his soul, and they were, For God's sake, let me die in peace. There is also his apocryphal deathbed utterance to a priest upon being asked to renounce Satan. This is no time to be making enemies. I hope that one's true. It's so like him. These are the facts of Voltaire's death, not counting the Satan bit. They don't drive that well with the other one's report, do they? So, what's his source here? Well, these words were part of a longer conversation reported later by Voltaire's doctor, Theodore Tranchin, who was also a lay minister. He wrote in a letter of a long deathbed screed by Voltaire from which the other one picks and chooses, and I've included a link to that as well in the description. There is no other source for these words but Tranchin. That doesn't prove the doctor was lying, of course, but his account faces certain problems. First, these quotations are unlike Voltaire's known statements, even those he was making at this same time. Second, Tranchin reported this conversation in a private letter professing his own faith, which might have led him to color the account somewhat, and at the least demonstrates a likely expectation that the words would never face public scrutiny. Third, and most convincing, Voltaire had a priest right there who could have saved him if he was really scared, and he didn't take advantage of it. Given all that, the most likely conclusion seems to be that the doctor was mistaken. The other one includes other apocryphal or plainly untrue last words. Thomas Carlyle, for example, whose last word was goodbye, he has saying, I am as good as without hope, a sad old man gazing into the final chasm. I can find no documentation for this, except that every fundamentalist site out there reports it faithfully. Thomas Paine's deathbed recantation, in which he wishes that his Age of Reason, one of the most important documents in human history, had never been published, is a fabrication that didn't appear until ten years after his death, and was vigorously repudiated by those who had been present. The other one, though, happily recounts it. My favorite is this one from Aldemont the Skeptic. 
Now that, brothers and sisters, is a lament. Poisoned his friend, beggared his boy, murdered his wife? It's pretty compelling. I confess the track in Aldemont's last words gave me some trouble, but I finally figured out why. First, the other one had misspelled his name, but more important, he doesn't exist. He never did. He's from an 18th century novel by Edward Young, which I've also linked below. That's right, he's a fictional character, and the other one quotes him as if he were a real person. That's why he's my favorite. Another along these same lines is this one from Sir Thomas Scott, Chancellor of England, that reads, Until this moment I thought there was neither God nor hell. Now I know and feel that there are both, and I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. That's pretty straightforward, except for two things. First, the office now called Chancellor of Britain, or Lord High Chancellor, is partly ecclesiastical in nature, and so one would expect it to go to a Christian. Also, I've checked a list of all the chancellors, going back a thousand years, and there's never been one named Thomas Scott. I'm serious. At the beginning of the 19th century, there was a Sir John Scott, Lord Eldon, who served two separate terms as Chancellor. In between, the Chancellor was Sir Thomas Erskine. Is that a coincidence? A Thomas between two Scots? Do you suppose that the other one was just randomly picking names off a list, saw these two names next to each other, and got them mixed up? Given him the benefit of the doubt, I went looking for a Sir Thomas Scott who might fit the bill. It is not a terribly uncommon name, and I found many Thomas Scots during my research, but most were not British, and most of the British ones were ministers, strangely enough. The closest I could get is a Sir Thomas Scott who served in Parliament and held a ton of other government positions, but not Chancellor, in the 16th century. I don't know for sure that this is who the other one meant, but it's the best I could do. This Scott was a Protestant who was enthusiastic about the persecution of Catholics. In fact, he was so enthusiastic that he was put in charge of persecuting Catholics. If this is the right guy, my guess is that the quote was made up. Maybe by angry Catholics. Regardless, he was not an atheist, and neither were the others, so what's the point? This video is full of people who weren't atheists, actually, and that's the second problem with it. You have the Voltaire quotes above, of course, and he also mentions Edward Gibbon's apocryphal last words, even though Gibbon, too, was a deist, alongside those of the Emperor Severus, who was a polytheist. He includes this bit from Gandhi. But these were not Gandhi's last words. The other one admits that he wrote this months before his death. Aside from that, Gandhi, of course, was Hindu. To the other one, there's apparently no difference between being an atheist and not being Christian. Of course, that doesn't explain this quotation. Oh, my poor soul, what will become of thee? Whither wilt thou go? These are the alleged last words of Cardinal Mazarin. Cardinal Mazarin was, of course, a cardinal. He was one of the most powerful and influential clergymen of his day, and presumably a Christian. So, the other one's video is misnamed. It should be called Last Words of Famous Non-Christians, plus a couple of Christians who didn't believe hard enough and a couple of guys who were just plain made up. I left a very polite comment to this effect, and the other one responded by reporting my comment as spam. It turns out that he has reported every single comment to this video as spam. That's why I wrote this, because I couldn't write over there. That's right. I sat down and made dozens of drawings and over a hundred screens on the publisher, spent several days teaching myself to edit video, and wrote and researched a 2,000-word script because I couldn't leave a 20-word comment. I believe that the other one's intention in making his video was to inspire people, and if that's the case, I congratulate him. He certainly succeeded in inspiring me. Ah, oh, well. The truth that the other one is trying to obscure here is that human beings, no matter their religion or lack thereof, generally approach death with trepidation. For the same reason we pass a door into a dark room with care. We don't know what's on the other side. 
That room might hold a pretty girl. Or a psycho killer. Or just some furniture we'll stub our toes on. We might be afraid, and we might not, but we tread carefully. Mazarin, if this report, unlike the others, is true, is a Christian dying in fear, uncertain of what's to come. Thomas Hobbes is also uncertain. To me, he sounds less fearful than Mazarin, probably because he didn't believe in hell, and Mazarin did. It is not clear to me that a belief in hell is a comfort at the end of life. I bet I could find some other despairing deathbed quotes from Christians if I wanted to, but really, what kind of person wants to do that? Finally, even if all these quotes were accurate, and all came from atheists, the other one would have a weak argument here. Does being near death give us insight into the great mysteries of the universe? Not obviously. Consider all the people who slip into dementia at the end of their lives. But even allowing that it does, what then of all the non-Christians who face death unafraid and unrepentant? What should we make of Heinrich Heine's last words? Byron sure seemed to be at peace, didn't he? Oscar Wilde is probably the best. Always leave him laughing. How about Darwin, simple and elegant to the last? Considering how much last words vary on the subject, isn't the best bet simply that the speakers knew no more at the end than they had in the middle of life? Isn't it likely that none of this proves anything at all? Personally, I've always been fond of Bertrand Russell's words on the subject, and though they weren't his last, they were at least definitely his, and we'll let them be the last here. I believe that when I die I shall rot, and nothing of my ego will survive. I am not young, and I love life. But I should scorn to shiver with terror at the thought of annihilation. Happiness is nonetheless true happiness because it must come to an end. Nor do thought and love lose their value because they are not everlasting. Many a man has borne himself proudly on the scaffold. Surely the same pride should teach us to think truly about man's place in the world. Even if the open windows of science at first make us shiver after the cozy indoor warmth of traditional humanizing myths, in the end, the fresh air brings vigor, and the great spaces have a splendor of their own.